And then I shot at EDC Las Vegas, and my friend Bennett had reached out to me. He was like the director of photography for Insomniac. So it was really just a compounding effect for the gigs that you got. Yeah, it's just like one led to the other. It, you know, it's like I said, I, I had to put in the work to show like right. I gave a shit and then yeah. like I could do this. Welcome back everyone to the Nickels and Dimes show. I'm your host, Chris Nichols. Today we have Eric Skyer as our guest. He's a professional photographer, works for himself. He's built a big following online. Uh, with some incredible shots, but we talk about his journey from being in the Navy to getting out and getting involved in the cannabis industry, which was in the early days of that. And he worked at this company that started this waterless car wash business. So he, we have a big theme of trends and of him getting involved with these different trends that became big things pretty early on, which I thought was really cool. And regarding his photography career, we talk about his journey, how he started to monetize that. And one big question I had about that was, how do you determine your value as a photographer when it is so subjective and there's so many different photographers out there? So some really cool stuff. And if you're a aspiring photographer or an artist of any sort, I think you're going to get a lot out of this episode. And of course, we touch on the entrepreneurship stuff that I always like to talk about with my guests. Quick mention of each sponsor, we have Truve, which is a plant-based energy tea. You can use the code nickels and dimes at checkout to get 50% off your first order. Link is in the description. And then we have Jungle Athletico, a jujitsu supply and apparel brand. You can use the code nickels and dimes at checkout to get 15% off. Then we have Guy Fox, a cologne brand. You can get 10% off by using the code dimes, D-I-M-E-Z. And then Surf Dirt, which is a non-toxic sunscreen, is good for your face, good for the ocean. Use the code nickels and dimes for that. And this is all in the description. Now, please enjoy this episode with Eric. Eric Sauer, man. What's up? Hey, what's up, Chris? How you doing, man? Good, man. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for coming by. I appreciate you stopping by, setting this all up, and, and uh, taking time out of your day. <laughs> it's always an adventure. Being a, a remote show situation, I always find a new environment, and it takes some creativity. So I appreciate your help. Yeah, uh, it's always a bonding experience with people who come on the show. <laughs> yeah, I bet I, it's a handful because you never know what you're getting into. So I'm glad we had what we needed to get set up here. Today. Oh, absolutely, and and it's nice and comfy. So cool. Yeah, man. Well, I'm I'm stoked to learn about your story, Alex Taylor, the tasteless gentleman. He connected us. Yes, and you know, it's I, I ask every entrepreneur who comes to my show at the end, hey, who's one person you think I should come on? And he brought up your name, so uh, definitely a. a a high value referral coming from him. Yeah, I appreciate that. Alex is a great guy and he does a lot of he does a lot of interesting things that Oh yeah. I didn't even know he was involved in when I first met him and then it just I, I figured it out and I was like that's out of control. Yeah. So I can't wait to check out your uh, interview with him and see how that one went. Absolutely, man. Yeah, well, you you've had a interesting story. So your main business today is photography. You've yes. had you've 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 built an amazing portfolio of Thank shots you. and you know your your online presence is 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 big and it's just some really cool stuff that I, I want to understand your journey, how you got there, and then uh, just ask some questions specifically about y your business and how you operate today. But I think a good place to start would just be to get to know where you come from more. Like, w where did you grow up? What was life like? And I mean, what got you into this idea of entrepreneurship whenever that came to you? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and we'll just start off like you said a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley, which is just north of Los Angeles. If you've ever been to LA and you've mm -hmm. lived there long enough, you know where the valley is. Right. <laughs> so uh, it's just kind of like the suburban outpost. You know, it's 20 minutes away from Hollywood, 30 minutes from downtown. This is all with no traffic, mind you. Yeah. So um, I grew up there um, when I was about 12. Um, you know, when I was younger, my parents had separated. And nonetheless, uh, when I was about 12, my mom moved to Hawaii. Mm. So I actually was fortunate enough. I got to go and move there with her. I might have been a little younger than 12, to be honest. I might have been like nine. And um, so I moved to Hawaii with my mom. And um, I guess that's where I kind of got my first taste of like, I just want to like entrepreneur and not work a nine to five because nobody out there really was working a nine to five, it <laughs> seemed like. Everyone was at the beach all the time. It was like, whoa, how do you live a life like this? So I, I would say that might have been my first taste of like not working a commercial lifestyle with work nine to five, so to speak, you know, checking in in the office and all that. But um, so I lived in Hawaii for about four years and then uh, I came back to um, the San Fernando Valley 
finished up, you know, junior high, high school. And I went to a couple different schools growing up. So I was I had a lot of interaction with different people. I got to meet a lot of new people, traveled different schools, different places. Um, so I went to Granada High for a while, went to Chatsworth High, graduated. Um, and then I was going to go into the military, but I was a little, you know, you're 18. You don't know what you want to do. You're a little hesitant, like, oh, I'm going to miss all this cool stuff. Like, you're not going to miss anything. At least that's what I figured out. So I stayed in the Valley until I was about 21. Then I joined the Navy, yep. um, which was a great experience for me. I was stationed here in San Diego, about 15 minutes from where we're chatting right now. Mm -hmm. um, I spent all my four years of service in San Diego. Nice. Um, I did a few deployments, which was incredible. A lot of hard work, mm -hmm. a lot of late nights. But, I mean, you know, you're in the military. What do you expect, right. you know? But I met a lot of great people, and I went to a lot of amazing places. So that was a really phenomenal experience for me. And, you know, while I was in the military, I, I had a little um, digital camera, you know, and we're, this, we're going back in time a little. Digital yeah. cameras weren't like they are like today. This right. was before iPhones were even yeah. out. So, what you know. did you do in the military? Oh, when I, well, yeah, that's a great question. When I was in the military, I, was, I started off just as, as a deck seaman. Uh -huh. So I was out there painting the ship every day. We worked on the rigging for the... Um, for like transfers from ship to ship. I worked on the, uh, the boat rig uh, the boat. It's called the boat Davit. So it's what lowers the boat down into the water when we need to go to shore or right. something like that. And then I, you know, got promoted and I worked as the bow hook on the boat that got dropped in. So I got to go in the boat. I worked on the flight deck as well, doing chalk and chain. Oh, cool. So when helicopters would land on our helo deck, uh, there would be like a crew of us and we'd run out there and we'd throw chalks under the tires if it was applicable mm -hmm. or we would or we would chain the helo down to the deck right so that it, w it would be secure while we're out at sea if it was staying on for a while sure. so i got to do a lot of really awesome things and that was my first like two years and then i um took a test because that's how you rank up when you're there and i and i became a gunner's mate third class so i started working on all the shipboard weapon systems uh -huh. from you know the nine millimeter handgun we were doing m14 m16 50 cal so I would train the crew on how to use the various firearms as well as conduct maintenance and just operational stuff on the, uh, on all the weapons on the ship. So very cool. It was, yeah, it was, it was a good time. I got to play with guns and stuff, yeah. <laughs> you know, I got to do like all the cool Navy stuff like you see on deck, You're right? like in Top Gun, you know, like I got to do all that cool shit. It was yeah. pretty, it was pretty neat, you know? So I, uh, it was definitely an experience. I'm glad I had it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I'm very thankful for that. Yeah. It was, yeah. It was a good time for sure. Nice. I, before we transition to leaving the Navy to the next thing, I want to talk a little bit about Hawaii because I grew up there. Okay, cool. So oh, really? where, where did you grow up? I grew up in Kailua Kona. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. On the big Island that, of Hawaii. Okay. So now what you said actually makes sense. About people not yeah. doing much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not that nobody on the big Island works. Don't get me wrong. Right. Like they're all hardworking people, but it's just a much slower pace of life. Right. You know, a, a week in Madland time, because that's what they call, you know, the continental United States is like a month their time, you uh -huh. know, a day is a week for that. You know, it's just, everything's just like, chill out, man. Yeah. Relax. Like, don't worry <laughs> about it, you know? Yep, yep. So I hear the pigeon tone in there. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, so it was just like a really cool yeah. experience to be there as like a teenager growing up and just having that kind of like influence, that kind of. You know, and the cultural diversity of Hawaii was really amazing. You right. know, I was I was the oddball out, yeah. which was oh, which was you know a good experience for me. I think growing up, I it know just gave you me mean, a lot man. of perspective. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you get it. You know, we're Howley boys out there. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're not. But it, you know, I was also young enough that you know I didn't get really messed with, and then I kind of grew up with these guys. So right. I had a little bit more of a rapport with the local boys. Uh -huh. I'd always be at the beach with them. They knew I wasn't just like living there for a summer or something yeah. like that. So. It, it was really cool. I learned a lot, and I have so much respect for Hawaii, the culture, the people, everything out there. I love that place. I'm actually going in like two weeks oh, to nice. see my mom. She's back out there. Nice. So, there yeah. Go. I haven't been there in 20-something years, so I'm very excited to go back. Yeah, yeah and it was a special place for sure. I'm always thankful for uh, having grown up there. But uh, I, I let, let's get back to your transition, though, Absolutely. from the Navy into the next thing well, yeah. what was that like well it was wild um because right when i got out of the navy i was like what am i gonna do for work um you know this this guy i knew was operating a uh, a car wash business 
So he was like, Hey, I'd love to hire you. You know, I know you have experience with managing people. Cause I mean, I mean, I did once I was in the Navy, you know, you're responsible for tasks and jobs and keeping mm-hmm. crews of people together. So I was managing a, uh, you know, it was like a little mini hand car wash company. Okay. You know, we worked out of like a mall parking lot and, um, and then, um, another friend of mine was involved in the cannabis industry at the same time and he was like hey man if you know you're interested in doing this too you know would you be into getting into this and i was like well yeah absolutely (laughs) like why the hell wouldn't i be interested in this you know and this you know we're talking this was back in 2008 yeah so it was a little more of the golden era of of the cannabis industry i see Mm -hmm. a lot less regulation it was a lot more gray so it wasn't the most legal But it wasn't super illegal. Right. So, you know, and everybody was making a lot of money at the time. So I kind of jumped on that train. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was managing this car wash like six days a week, you know, which I I loved doing that. That was a great gig. And then, you know, by night, you know, it was like I would go and work on these, you know, cannabis operations I was involved in. And it was just it was a really wild experience because you're kind of, you know, it's a little sketchy, you know, because you're like, I can't really tell people what I'm doing. It's like like you're batman or something you know you have like this alter ego Uh and like lifestyle you're living and uh it it was just a really wild experience we got up to a point where we were you know you know there was a crew of us and we were you know managing a few different warehouses a few different locations doing you know a couple hundred pounds every couple months of Uh weed you know and it was it was a lot of work yeah so share more about what that cannabis operation was what were you doing for them specifically what was the the business as yeah, much well, as you're able to. I mean, yeah. I mean, the business was, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, cultivate and, and, uh-huh. and sell. I wasn't involved in any of the external parts of it. I, my main, my main thing was just operational overview. I would go in and I would help with some of the design of things, you know, we'd work as a team on most of this stuff, you mm. know? So there'd be like, you know, you know, the, the higher up guys would get like the warehouse we'd work out of, they'd work out a deal with somebody and then we'd figure out the layout of the place. And then we'd go in there and you build out frames and things. You get your trays lined up and you set up your lighting system, your exhaust, ventilation. And then you just you start going, you know. So we would, you know, set up, like I said, we have different size ones. So we had like one with 16 lights. We had another one with like 32, one with 14. We had some small ones with like six. Mm-hmm. So we just had different sized operations kind of scattered throughout the San Fernando Valley. You know, and I, I'm sure there was a hundred other people just like us doing the same damn thing. Yeah. But so, yeah, we would just, you know, we, we were not a large group of people. We, we were kind of a tight knit little crew. Better and that we way. would, uh, <laughs> we, we'd go in and we'd set up our operations, you know, and just, you know, we'd set up our lights, grow our, grow our product. Mm-hmm. We had a couple people that would come help us trim it all. We'd have little trim parties where we're just working for like three days straight, hunkered down in these like small rooms, just ch- ch- Chip, chip, chopping away, <laughs> listening to music, shooting yeah. the shit for hours on end. And then, uh, you know, we'd all break off and see each other again in a few months. Was Were you guys working with dispensaries or were you? Or, we were working with some dispensaries. You know, mm-hmm. we had, you know, some of it, that's why it was like a gray area. You know, I some see. of it was legal. So we had, we were tied in with some dispensaries. We had some prescriptions of patients and things like that. And then, you know, some of it would, you know, go off elsewhere to wherever it went you i know? see yep. so okay. you know i was just getting my paycheck and kind of not asking too right. many questions <laughs> fair enough <laughs> fair enough boy it, it got you you by for that point in your life coming out of the navy and i mean you had these two jobs you were doing it yeah. seemed like they kind of just they they kind of fell into place so did you really aggressively look for what that next I, thing was going I to didn't. be i didn't you yeah. know um i've never really been you know i always believe you know, for me, like if I'm, if I'm thinking about something, if I'm manifesting it, like, you know, whatever will come my way. Mm. I've never been one to hunt things down. Sometimes when I start hunting something down, I'm like, am I really interested in this? Or am I more excited on the hunt of what's happening? Like, Mm -hmm. is this something I really could see myself spending my time doing? Or does it just look good on paper? Does it sound good to tell somebody? Oh, I do ABC, you know, and they're like, Ooh, that's cool. You know, Mm -hmm. but you know, I I was fortunate enough that these opportunities kind of presented themselves to me. And so therefore I was able to take advantage of them. And then once I was put into my position, I would just try to excel the best I could and make the most of where I was at. For sure. So, um, where do you think you got that mentality from? Ah, 
I mean, partly from being in the Navy, you know, you're, you know, you're, 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 you're tasked with things, you know, so you have to really take initiative with it and do the best job you can do. Because if you just sit to the wayside, you're going to fall to the wayside. So, you know, it's like in the Navy, you know, or, or it, this applies to everything, you know? Yeah. If you work hard and, and you, you, you show determination in what you're doing and you show pride in your work, you know, people notice that. And I, I learned that in the military, you know, just work hard, show pride in what you do. And, and, and the rest will kind of take care of itself. Hard work, there's no replacement for hard work at right. the end of the day. And hard work doesn't necessarily mean breaking your back. It doesn't necessarily mean working until your fingers are bleeding. Right. It just means whatever you're doing at that time, just put all your effort into it. Sure. And then that way you can cultivate good results out of it. Mm. You know, it's like growing yeah. some weed, you know? If, <laughs> yeah. If you give a shit, you're going to get good shit. Right. But if you're just lackadaisy about it, you're going to get lackadaisy results. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I got some of that kind of drive from, from the military, you know, because, I mean, outside of that, you know, I was just kind of a young stoner you know kid before that you know i mean i worked hard you know like when i was in high school i worked at a pizza place uh -huh. you know so i was like the assistant manager and i would be delivering pizzas and stuff too sure you know i always worked so it wasn't ever just like oh i don't know i'll see what happens i always made sure i was putting money in my pocket yeah. somehow even if it was not always the most legit work you right. know because on top of the pizza place i would you know i'd sell weed a little bit back yeah. in the day you know we're talking this is the 90s and 2000s sure. yeah. you know it was a different era there weren't dispensaries right <laughs> <laughs> so exactly life was a lot different back then yeah. you know but you know i was kind of hustling a little bit and just entrepreneuring it i guess you could say even at yeah. a younger age nice um yeah. so i guess all of that kind of just like if you're gonna do something do it put good effort into it you know the more you put in the the better you'll get out you know if you right. don't do that you're gonna just get shitty results for sure no that that's a major theme especially on this podcast with all the people i have on so i i love to hear you say that uh okay well cool well I, let's transition so how long did you do this this uh uh the, the car wash stuff it, yeah it was car wash right it was, and it was a car wash and then you know it expanded into a valet okay and then we expanded to a second location it i, I was geez i was doing that for like three years okay and i was like the full-on operational manager uh -huh. there was the owner and then it was me like i was the one just hiring people you know he would help hire and and, and fire but i mean other i was ordering every you know like i was running the business you know i was managing the business and running it and he was the owner of it so he'd cut the checks and make sure everything was okay. We had our insurances right. up to date. Mm -hmm. And then we had the valet. And then that was a really cool experience too, which yep. just, you know, and that was kind of an entrepreneurial thing with me because this guy bought the business mm -hmm. and was like, will you run it for me? Kind of. So, I mean, I kind of got thrown into this like business I had no idea about. And it was like a kind of an entrepreneurial type deal because mm -hmm. it was a, it was just him and I running it. And then we obviously hired some amazing employees that were there working with us. And I, we, I wouldn't have been able to do it without these guys we had working with us. You know, it was right. like, there was like five of us and we were just kicking ass. It was, it was a lot of hard work, but it was, it was a lot of, it was a lot of damn fun at the right. same time, you yeah. know? And, and that's the thing when you're doing something that you appreciate and you're putting hard work into, like you'll get the results. Mm -hmm. Like I'd be out there on the asphalt. It'd be like a hundred degrees and we would just be washing cars, man. Like wow. it sucked. But at the same time, like I felt, fulfilled every day like oh, you know I, cool. I worked hard i earned my my money for the day you know and, and it taught me you know discipline and people skills and patience and you know you're learning all these things while you're getting your ass kicked kind of you know mm -hmm. you got to get you got to go through it before you can come out and appreciate the lessons you're learning while you're learning them you know so it was a it was just a great experience and i did the car wash for like three years so i think i did that till about 2010 yep and then he had sold the business and then he went on and did his, his other things. And, and we just parted ways, you know, I, I still talk to the guy to this day. He's nice. a, he's a friend of mine still, you know, I saw him a couple of weeks ago and he's just, you know, he's just doing other businesses and other, other ventures now, you sure. know? So I was really thankful that I got included in that and, and got to experience what it was like to be on the kind of a ground up of, because when we took over this car wash business, it was very mundane it was like really run of the mill i mean they have them in all the malls now it's like the mm. the go you know it's like those waterless car washes oh okay yeah we were doing this back in 2007 oh, wow. so it was kind of like in the beginning stages of this you know 
waterless, eco-friendly car wash oh, thing that takes that happens in the malls. Okay. So and we were doing this up in the San Fernando Valley, and I and I think so. Car- you you kind of had a trend of jumping on things early. Yeah, on these trends. Yeah, right? I've been With- fortunate enough to kind of get in. Yeah, you know, I mean, is it is it is it just pure luck? Probably, you know, I'm not I'm not <laughs> well, I'm not going to say I have foresight for trends, but you know, I like I said, so I was doing the. That would be cool to have foresight of trends. It, it certainly would be. That's how you get rich. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that'd be that'd be incredible. Yeah, I, and I'm going to be curious to see how that uh, applies to your photography. We'll get into that here in a second, though. Absolutely. So uh, the car wash thing that kind of came to a close, and then I was in the cannabis industry and doing that. And I mean, I probably did that for another three, three years, two years after that. Um, I, I, uh, I just was kind of not wanting to be in the industry anymore. Had a falling out with some people I was working with. Just things changed, you know, times change, people change, everything changes. Right. It's the evolution of anything, you know, there's change. So we had then uh, split ways. I moved down to North County, San Diego. And this was around 2000 and I want to say 12, around 2012. I was still doing a little bit of the cannabis stuff, just on a much smaller scale now for a personal thing, just to help pay bills because I was starting to venture into photography at this time. Okay. 2012. Yeah. About 10 years ago, I was starting to really like Instagram was becoming more popular. You know, people were downloading it on their apps, you know. I remember at this time on social media, having like 10,000 followers was like, who is this person? Right. They have 10,000 followers. Like, so this was like really old school Instagram era. Uh-huh. And I, I was looking at people's art. And, you know, when I was in the Navy, like I had mentioned, I had a digital camera. I was just going to bring that up. I know I cut you off when you said that and asked about what you did in the Navy, but I was just going to transition back to that. Yeah. What so, was the role of this digital camera? It, you know, it was my mom's digital camera. It wasn't anything special. I mean, thinking back about it now, it was some like three megapixel, like, you know. Sure. You know, I, like I said, iPhones weren't even out yet. So we didn't have like this like rapid photo technology. And I, I had been taking photos while I was, you know, on deployments. So I would take pictures of things and I wasn't, I, I didn't do the best job of archiving any of it. I, I have it somewhere on a, on a CD-ROM, I think, oh, but wow. I think some of the files got corrupted. Mm. You know, it is what it is. Right. But at that time, I was passionate about taking photos. Like, there was something, like, I just enjoyed about capturing an image, like, that that I saw. Like, it just, you know, it's art to me. It's something that I'm seeing. I, say, I get a feeling from it, and I'm just capturing it, you know? So I, I, I was enjoying that when I was in the Navy, and I remember getting out. I was like, I kind of want to get into photography, and... And, and do some of that. It's funny, I've, I've reconnected with an old uh, girlfriend of mine who I was dating while I was in the military. And she's like, you told me you wanted to be a, a photographer when you got out. And I was like, I, I didn't even remember that. Oh, she's wow. like, yeah. And I was like, you should maybe get a job. And that's when I had started working at the car wash oh, and wow. stuff like that. <laughs> Not that she was leading me in the wrong direction or anything, but it was just like, okay, so I've always kind of been, I've been, I've been wanting to do this, you know, mm. like subconsciously I've been, this is something I've been wanting to do. Wow. You know, so okay. it feels really good to be in this space I'm in now. So like I said, you For know, sure. I had the camera in the Navy and then in around 2012, the social media with the Instagram was kind of becoming a thing. And I was seeing the quality of some of these people's photographs. And I was like, they're not taking these on iPhones, man. There's no, there's no way. Yeah. So I, I, uh, you know, I was the, the woman I was with at the time for Christmas had bought me a camera. And this was like 2012. And then I, you know, cause I was taking stuff on my cell phone a lot, but then the, the camera really unleashed my creativity because I was able to expand more. I could do different settings. And, and so I started photographing a lot of uh, the stars, which was my, it's like kind of my favorite thing to photograph is nighttime and astro astrotography. Um, so I started following, you know, other photographers that are just like phenomenal astrotographers and just being like, wow. How are these guys doing mm-hmm. that? And what was your your purpose of of getting into photography at this time? Was it to post on social media when it was still the early days of Instagram? Yeah, it was. I was highly motivated by that. You know, there was that dopamine rush of posting and getting likes and like getting traction. And so you, you were know, hoping to you were actually working to build a following. Yeah, a hundred percent. That was my goal. I wanted to build a following to gain an audience so that therefore I could potentially sell my art 
you know, I wanted to get into art galleries. Like th that's always been a hope of mine to, you know, sell my art to people who appreciate it and want it in their homes. Mm -hmm. But that's a really hard hurdle to jump into. Cause I mean, there's a million and one artists out there, you know, and right. you really have to work on your craft. Not that I haven't been, but I haven't been focusing heavily on that over the last 10 years. But at that moment in time, earlier in my career, the, the passion for the art was my real driving point. Okay. So, you know, I would just go drive around in the mountains. I would take photos of sunrises, sunsets, a lot of landscape photography, you know, kind of the general run of the mill, like landscape stuff, you know, but there's, there's something to be said about that because it's, it's artistic in a way, you know, you have a different sunrise every morning, a different sunset every night. Mm. It's all so varying in, in what you get and the kind of art you can create out of that. Mm. So I was doing that for a, you know, maybe a year or two, just kind of focused on the, um, the, the artistic aspect of it. And then I started doing some more cityscapes and more urban photography. Mm -hmm. And then I, uh, I was kind of wanting to get into nightlife photography as well, which is where I'm kind of at now as right. event and nightlife. But even with the, uh, the cityscapes and landscapes, I started to get opportunities to work with like hotels and and local businesses because they were like oh we really like this photo you took of san diego uh, could you maybe take some photos and and we could work collaboratively you know i've done you know i worked did some stuff with hyatt back in like 2016 17 and i still work with hyatt to this day they're a client of mine i i usually yearly we do something you know so it's pretty cool that like these these small relationships that like I fostered in my earlier days as mm -hmm. a photographer have now blossomed into like careers, like clients as, as my, in my professional career. Now, when I was more of just like dilly dallying and, and getting my feet wet, like now that like I'm more established, I still have these amazing clients I'm able to shoot for and, and create content for them. And, and it's like, I'm making a living off of it, which is mm -hmm. even cooler. So incredible. So uh, you really so we do have a third example of you getting uh, into a trend early. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. We do. Yeah, yeah. Because you were, and this was a big theme of my podcast conversation with Alex and the Tasteless Gentleman. They yeah. were on Facebook early. They had 7 million followers and then, yeah. you know, Instagram. And so, but they, they got, they got hit because they got uh, deplatformed, right? With their yeah, content. Yeah, I but, remember all that, <laughs> man. That was a tough time for him. Right. But it was still the timing that was such a huge problem player in, in their success, right? Yeah. I mean, they came up when Barstool came up and it sounds like you had your niche where you did the same type of thing. Yeah. And I, I mean, how would you, okay, I have a couple of questions. Ask away. Let's, let's say, how did you compare to the other photographers who were trying to do the same thing you were at that time? Was there a big presence or were there very few of you guys? I mean, you know, there was a large presence of us and it's it's really wild to think back because a lot of these guys that were the kind of, you know, the 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 uh, the pioneers, so to speak, you know, they're still in it today. Uh, you know, a lot of these guys that are fellow photographers, I I still see I see them. We I you know Sony is one of my clients, which I'm extremely thankful for because I mean I I shoot on Sony and like I work with them. It's like a dream client, you know. Right. So every year they put on this event called Sony Condo. And it's, it's where they invite out photographers, musicians, uh, videographers, just basically everyone kind of that can use a Sony product and is involved in it. They, we get like a, it's like a one week getaway and it's like a, a workshop. So they're teaching you about photography, about the new cameras that are coming out, just like workshops with other professionals so you can up your skills. It's just like a, an amazing networking event. And a lot of these guys that were early out on Instagram in the early, you know, 2010, 2012 era, they're at this event. So it's like, it's kind of cool to see it kind of come full circle for all of us because we've all, you know, as, you know, as these like Instagram photographers, I mean, it gets like a bad rap. Oh, I'm an Instagrammer because there's now this like whole era of these like influencers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, we were kind of like the old school people doing this, right. you know, it was, it was, we were figuring out this, we were navigating this landscape before yeah. it was what it is today. You know, you, brand deals weren't really a thing. You would kind of reach out to a brand and be like, Hey, you want, you want to do something like yeah. we could leverage my social media to you. And it would just, it was kind of 
it was all, it was like the wild, wild west back then, sure. you know, like mm-hmm. it was just wild, you know, but I have a lot of uh, uh, friends that do amazing stuff with amazing companies now, you know? Yeah. And they were just local street photographers, just kind of like doing their passion, things they had been doing for the last few years. And, you know, some of them, you know, shoot lookbooks for Nike now, yeah. you know, they do stuff with Adidas. I have fr- friends that are working with, you know, top car companies in the country from, you know, Hyundai, Ford, Lamborghini, like they're just working with amazing brands and doing incredible things. And we all just kind of started out in the same place. You know, a lot of people have fallen off too, because it, it's hard. Mm-hmm. It's a difficult landscape to navigate because, you, you know, you got to set your own worth and, and you got to know the worth you're bringing to the table. Yeah. And you got to also be able to deliver mm-hmm. on what you're talking about. <laughs> Which is which is also part of it, you know. You got to put in that that effort to show that mm-hmm. you care, so that the client can see that and then reciprocate on that, and right. you continue to you know have that. Yeah. So that brings up an interesting question. I have. I mean, that certainly shines light on the professionalism of running your business as a photographer and being a good business person. But how do you determine your value as a photographer? What makes a really great picture uh from someone maybe who's average or, or not so great and 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 on that note this is your shot here on the wall this, yeah this is actually yeah this you know, is my photo it's amazing because i've seen this Thank on you. google okay yeah times. i mean it's a popular spot it's <laughs> yeah a, it's a this popular location yeah it, it, it's actually point loma oh, point loma that's right yeah, I yeah. See. okay but it, the similar angle is from coronado but yeah this is point loma there's like you got to go up into the neighborhoods and find the the right hill you know, yeah. and then I took the, you know, this is like in the middle of the night or something. I took this to get all the city lights. Incredible lit up. shot. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, there's a million people have taken a photo like this and they all are amazing in their own right. That's my question. So, yeah. yeah. So, I, I mean, to, to say, you know, what makes a photo good or what makes a photo bad, that's completely perceptual. You know, I, I could look at someone's photo and be like, yo, yo I love this. I right. think it's amazing. And someone might look at it and be like, I do not like this at all you know there's certain trends in photography that are popular right now that i don't agree with but clients love it and they want more of it Mm -hmm. so it's like it's an ever-changing evolution of what people want to see with with that so i don't know because i have some friends that they're not professional photographers they just take pictures for fun and they do some amazing work Mm -hmm. they're better than some professionals i i know professionals that take photos and i'm like ooh, like that's the photo you're okay i don't i'm not seeing it yeah but at the same time like yeah i could be like you know oh i'm i'm a worthy voice on judging this or judging that but at the end of the day it's it's artistic freedom it's creativity so i you know everyone has their own perception of that so i don't think i'm one to kind of set the bar on where that is or what makes someone not or someone be Mm mm-hmm a professional or not a professional or an amateur or you know whatever because i've taken some photos when i was considering myself an amateur that i still love today i'm like yeah like Mm. that was really fucking awesome yeah but it's like i wasn't considered a professional photographer then so would it get the same respect as it you know it's so i just think everyone who puts their heart into it is doing a good job for sure yeah i mean and that that really aligns with the whole philosophy of art in general right? yeah well what is considered a good art piece you can go to a museum and see these blobs of paint on a canvas and and it's yeah. worth you know many uh, you know, thousands or millions yeah, of dollars blobs or even just a stripe of paint sure yeah it, it's incredible to me yeah i i don't understand that but i also do at the same time you know? yeah so in the midst of this kind of ambiguity how do you sell your value as you're building your business as a photographer? I, I, for me, I, I try to sell my value and my, my value is consistency with what I deliver as a photographer. Mm. Um, I try to be, you know, extremely consistent with my quality of work, my body of work. You know, I, I've developed like a signature look with a lot of my photography. It's, it's funny. I get joked at it with fellow photographer friends. They're like, Oh, is this your photo? And I'm like, yeah, that one's yeah. mine. Because they just they just notice the editing style, right? The hues I use, different color tones. The you know, I'll palletize the images to look a certain way. You person per- personify it. Person. Yeah, yeah, I've given it some life, you know. Yeah. And the way I I give the, my images life, people know I'm the one feeding the life into the image. 
so to speak. I, you know, I never thought of it like that. But yeah. Well, that's so powerful right yeah. there. That, that's if people can look at a piece of art and guess that it's you, that's extremely powerful. I feel that it's extremely powerful. I'm extremely flattered when people notice my work because mm -hmm. that means I'm doing my job as an artist yeah. and a photographer you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm putting my name on my work, but I'm also not taking away from the client's work that I'm delivering, which is the best of both worlds to me as I'm able to be creative in my own space and also deliver work and get paid for it. So it's like, it's like I'm painting blobs and lines, but I'm, I'm doing it on a regular basis for clients. Right. And I also work with, you know, some, in, you know, intense clients, they have high demands and, and, and they're doing, you know, huge budget <clears throat> events you know, from, from major headlining concerts to corporate events that are, you know, upwards of a half a million dollars for these major companies that are, you know, they're going all out for their employees to have an amazing weekend somewhere. Yeah. So I'm, I'm documenting how these, these events are put on from the smallest details to the napkin holders, you know, right. like I'm taking photos of everything. Yeah. So it's up to me sometimes to like, I have to ex I have to go through this experience that they're putting on for their guests and then I have to document it and then I have to deliver this documentation and also in like a fun and lively way too so that it it draws more clients to to have their events there mm. and it also showcases the hard work that was put on by the clients that hired me to photograph this stuff because they need they want to have record and history of the hard work that they're doing. Right. So they can show like, oh, look at what we did and look at the setups we did. The lay how, how do we have it laid out? We know what kind of this, what, what kind of furniture? Like, mm -hmm. So I'm helping keep like a visual memory for them as well. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like I'm doing a couple different things with my photography, yeah. but it's all the, the purpose is to just keep people energetic and you know happy about things, I think, is the main Sure. The main delivery on it all, which is kind of neat. Yeah. Did you ever have any formal training to learn how to shoot or no. did you teach yourself? I taught myself. I was fortunate wow. enough that, and patient enough that I just kind of taught myself, which is not, you know, there's nothing bad about getting formally taught to do photography. I mean, I wish I was formally taught because then I'd, I'd, I'd probably be even further along than I am now, you know, but um, no, all self-taught, and I've learned things from other fabulous photographers along the way. A lot of YouTube videos, a lot of trial and error, right? Um, and and just just stretching the limits of what you can do. You know, it's it's like anything. There are parameters you work within, and you just you just expand those parameters and see how far you can take it. You know, because mm -hmm. I mean, there's only really three settings on a camera: your shutter speed, your aperture, and your ISO. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're having three points to work within. It's just how far can you stretch those to make them work together? It's like ingredients in a kitchen, you know, yeah. I, mean, I could analogize it all it's, day. No, it's a good way to simplify it. Yeah. Sure. You know, you can look at some of these advanced cameras today and it's very overwhelming. Yeah. A lot yeah. of buttons, a lot of buttons, a lot of, a lot of options, a lot of things. But at the end of the day, there's only really three settings. Your, your aperture, your ISO and your shutter speed. Mm -hmm. Those are what are going to deliver your final image. Yeah. The rest of the things will correlate to, you know, maybe image quality, you know, a bigger sensor, you'll get, you know, more image quality, um, faster shutter speeds. That's if you're trying to capture multiple action shots right. at one time, you know, mm -hmm. but if you're just taking pictures of like a tree, you don't, you click, click, you don't sure. need fast action sports yeah. camera. You just need mm -hmm. a camera to do the job. So right. It's kind of like being a mechanic, you know, how they have all these different tools, you know, sure. the more advanced the mechanic is, the more tools they need. But yeah. if you're just a, a general mechanic, you just need a good wrench. Mm -hmm. And that's all a good camera is, is just a good wrench. You yeah. know, everything else is accessorizing on it. So what was the point when you realized that this photography pursuit could actually be a business and you can make a living off of it? Could you just tell us about that? the first time you actually monetize this work? Yeah. And how that grew? It's wild. I was talking to a friend of mine about this the other day. Um, I, I wanted to get into shooting, um, like live music events, concerts, things like that. Um, I, I just like live music and I like the way, um, the lighting, look, just the vibe of like live music with the lights, you know, it just has this appeal to it. And who doesn't want to be at a concert? Like, come on, that's always a good time. Right. For sure. So I, uh, I, I didn't know where to start. So I was like, I got to just reach out to like a local DJ. And so my friend, I, I'm still good friends with him today, Robert. 
um, DJ Karma is what he goes by. Mm-hmm. He, uh, he he works in Las Vegas and here in San Diego and Salt Lake, you know, kind of around the country. And he was in San Diego at a local nightclub. And I mean, gosh, this was <laughs> like seven years ago. Yeah. I don't even remember. And I just, I, I reached out to him on social media and I was like, hey man, I'd love to take some photos of you in the club. Like I'm trying to build a portfolio as like a music photographer. How do I go about doing it? Like, can we do this? Like, uh, you know, you don't even have to pay me. He was like, yeah, 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 come on through. Let's do it. I was like, all right, sick, let's go. So I, you know, I hit him up. We linked up. We, I went to the nightclub. And that was my first time. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was just like, I got to get some cool photos of this guy DJing. And, and, I, and I did a pretty good job. I can look back on that gallery and be like, I did a good job. And was this after you had built a portfolio of the landscape, uh, cityscape stuff? Or Yes, okay. yes, absolutely. I'd already been doing a lot of the cityscape stuff. But you were new to the event concert scene. Absolutely. This was a whole other ballpark for me. And I right. was just like, because I was seeing some other photographers I knew were photographing these events. And I was like, well, this looks like a sustainable, like uh, these events happen, you know? And at the time, you know, I, I loved going to raves and I was like, how do I, if I could get in like Mix fun this. Yeah. into that, like this is, this is be awesome. Right. You know, obviously you're not partying or anything like that. You're working, but, but you're there. Like, you're there. Yeah. yeah. You're enjoying that, that, that whole vibe. So I, uh, I, I went to the nightclub and I was lost. I didn't know what the hell was going on. There was, it's, you know, there's a lot happening in a nightclub when you're not having a, a fun time and you're having to like focus on working, you know? So I was just like, all right, just, you know, stay focused. Like I was looking online. That's where I was getting a lot of inspiration. I was looking at other like DJ photographers and seeing the kind of photos they would take and like, what, what were they giving to their artists, you know? And I just went in there. I think I gave him like 30 photos. I don't know. Something small. He, he ended up paying me like a hundred bucks for coming out, which was so dope. Like I'm super appreciative of that. Very cool. He just yeah. did that. He was just like, here, man, thanks. You know, like I appreciate, I was like, thank you, bro. Like, yeah. like I said, him and I are still good friends to this right. day. Like, and that's how you have to start though. You, you really you just got to off, you do it for free. Yeah. I mean, listen, I, I'm, I'm, there's a fine line about working for free. For you sure. know, that I, that is so weird with the photography business. Cause a lot of people will do things they want to just do for free. And it's like, that could set a bad precedence for yourself as an artist in this field mm. because companies kind of remember, Oh, this guy will work for free. Like well, maybe we could just kind of keep him over there and, and only let him work for free. And then it, it kind of, you know, ruins it for everybody else. Mm. Cause then other comp, you know, companies might say, Oh, we don't have budget for this or we're just only going to pay this much because we know you want to be at this concert and you, you know, you want to take these photos, but then it also comes down to like, how much are you working? There's all these factors that measure into Interesting. it, but that's a whole other thing. Right. But, um, setting a rate and figuring out your worth with that, you know, it, it's, it's tricky because you gotta, you, you do have to kind of bite the bullet and put yourself out there. But then once you set that precedence and you, once someone reaches out to you, then you're like, all right, Mm -hmm. Now I can charge for this, but you got to be, you know, mindful of how much are you charging? Mm -hmm. Because of course, all of us want to go right out of the gate dollar. Boom. You know, I know my worth. We all know our worth and all of us are valuable. But at the same time, it's like experience plays into this, not just like because you're good and you can do it. There's, there's many factors that arise during a photo shoot that like, as a professional, I'm like, damn, if this was three years ago, I wouldn't have known what to do, but Mm. The further you get along, you're like, oh, I know how to handle this situation. So mm. that's why my value comes in a little higher okay. the more you do it. I want to dive into that specifically, specifically at concert event type situations, how you capture the right moment, what you look for, things like that. But just to connect the dots a little bit more after that first experience with your friend at yeah. the club, then did he, what was your main source of growth after that? Did he, did you get referrals? Did you just network I, yourself I con- around? I continued shooting with him for another couple nightclubs. Cause he came back, he would come back once or twice a week. Mm-hmm. And he was well known fairly. Yeah. I mean, he's a popular local DJ. Okay. He sh- plays at the bigger clubs down here. So I was able to get access into nightclubs with my camera. Ah, that was the key. That's big. I had, I had approved access like, don't get me wrong. You could sneak your camera into a club and take photos, but like you, you get caught. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Right. I didn't do that route, you know, but right. you could totally, 
You could totally do that. And I know people have amazing careers based off of that. Yeah. So I'm definitely not saying don't do that, but just like, no, if you get caught, they could be like, oh, no, give me your SD card or, or who knows? I don't oh, even wow. know. Yeah. They could be total jerks about yeah. it, you know? Anything that's, could happen. That's yeah. why you carry two SD cards, you yep. know? <laughs> if you're going to do it, be slick about it, yep. you know? Yep. Oh, but so, so I, I got access to some of the, uh, the bigger events and he would, this is the cool part is he would open DJ for bigger artists sometimes. So I remember one of the ones that really helped me get my feet into the ground was he was DJing at a local club here called Park. Yep. And um, he was opening for um, Laid Back Luke. Oh, cool. I think Laid Back Luke was playing mm -hmm. later in the night, but he was the opener. So he DJed before Laid Back Luke. And um, unbeknownst to me, uh, like Diplo was in town. Oh, wow. And Little John was in town. Oh, okay. So I was able to get access into the nightclub with my camera. And I got epic photos of this night of like laid back Luke, Little John, and Diplo inside there. And then it's like those, those kinds of things happened a couple times. So then now I had a portfolio. So now I could reach out because there's a local event company called Cross. Yep. They do, you know, cross fest. They mm -hmm. do proper NYE, fingers crossed. They do a whole lot of events out here. My LED is another one. They're like, they do all of that stuff here in San Diego. So I was like, okay, well, this is my obviously where I want to pivot to next, you know? And I had known they have a, an amazing director of photography that works for them. Her name's Felicia. And she, you know, had worked for them. Um, she had been working on them for maybe two, three years before me before I even started getting into like music photography. So she was like, and she had been shooting music for a while before that. And she still does, you know, we were shooting new year's Eve together. And, um, so I started building my portfolio. I reached out to her. I was like, Hey, like, uh, do, do you have any available things to shoot at these festivals and or nightclub stuff in San Diego? And then, um, she had put me in touch with their like marketing person. And then I started shooting at bang, bang, for uh what what is it crossfest or whatever right. i don't i don't remember my led or something so i was there shooting like now regularly i was like oh oh shit okay i'm making money now you know i'm making a couple hundred bucks a weekend mm -hmm. i'm working every weekend like i'm like okay all right, all right dope now i'm doing this and now i'm shooting like artists like you know i'm shooting bands like goldfish mm -hmm. i'm shooting too many djs i'm shooting nora and pure i'm shooting um I mean, I've shot so many different artists at Bang Bang. Yeah. It's hard to even remember. Uh, Dr. Fresh, I shot there. Uh -huh. um, like a, a lot of artists I, I've yeah. shot there. And it's this like small kind of intimate club. So it was kind of sure. cool. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I was working there for like a year. I, yeah. I want to say maybe longer. And No, go ahead. No. And then I started doing the music festival. I started shooting CrossFest for them. And that's, I was shot a couple CrossFests and I was like, holy shit, yeah. this is crazy. Yeah. And then I shot at EDC Las Vegas and my friend Bennett had reached out to me. He was like the director of, of photography for Insomniac. So it was really just a compounding effect for the gigs that you got. Yeah. It's just like one led to the other. It, you know, it's like I said, I, I had to put in the work to show like right. I gave a shit and then yeah. like I could do this. So you, you, you created a solid ground of content yeah. over the course of a few years mm -hmm. and that really was mostly held on online with the social media yeah. early days facebook instagram absolutely and i did most 90 percent of my stuff was via instagram and i would just reach out and i'd follow other people they'd follow mm -hmm. me back i interact and, and you know you might not think people are watching but people are watching right they were looking at what i was posting you know mm -hmm. and they, they which gave me credibility in what i do so then you know i i'd shot edc las vegas gosh what year was that Two thousand and I want to say it was like 2015, mm -hmm. maybe. That was like early on in my like career, you know, because I started about 2012. Uh, yeah. And then by 2015, I had shot EDC Las Vegas. Wow. So about a yeah. three year progression. Mm -hmm. Was I in way over my head? Absolutely. In EDC oh, you Las think Vegas. So? Oh, man. That was like one of the toughest experiences. I can imagine just given the production that they have of that thing. Yeah, it was a so, lot. I was not prepared for that, but uh -huh. I showed up and I did a good job. Right. And so, no one complained, so I'm happy. <laughs> good. <laughs> so you clearly learned a lot about how to shoot these different productions, different events, concerts on the go yeah. as you were doing it. Absolutely. So how would you describe 
how you find the right moment to to shoot. And then also, in addition to that, you leave these events with hundreds of photos to choose from. Yeah. Maybe even more. I don't know. Thousands. Thousands. Thousands of photos. Incredible, yeah. right? And then I'm curious about the selection process after that, because that's one of the most overwhelming things for me to think about is, I, you know, if I take a few pictures with some friends and they've, we've got like 10 pictures to choose from, I'm sitting there, I have no idea, you know, which one. Mm-hmm. And you have you have to be an expert about it in your position yeah, uh, and, and almost uh, brutal about it. Yes. It, and, and deleting. But yeah, how, how do you <laughs> find the right moment? Finding the right moment is tricky. It's, it's tricky, but not tricky. It's just, it's like hunting. You just got to be patient. You know, sometimes you only get the first like 15 minutes to capture. So it's more of like, I'm going to just really lay into my shooting right now. I'm going to set up in good angles. And I'm fortunate with, with a lot of these events I work at. Cause like, you know, one of my main clients is now Petco park. So you kind of get used to it. it. It's, it's weird. It just comes, it just comes over time. I want to say, because like at a rave, for instance, you know, with like electronic music with the DJ, there's a lot more going on with that kind of event with like pyrotechnics, lasers. So with like the, the electronic music, it's, it's a lot of like being patient and just finding the shot. You gotta, sometimes you gotta find it. Sometimes it just happens, you know, finding the moment. It it just comes down to, I mean, it's after a little, it's after some practice, you know, you kind of get the run of how a production of an artist is going to be at a concert, you know, Right when they come out on stage, boom, they're making their presence known. They're going to be in the spotlight. There's going to probably be a big bang. Right. I also try to talk to the pyrotechnic people, Uh huh. pyrotechnic crew, stage managers. I always talk to them. Yeah. Because they know what's going to happen. They've been doing this tour Uh or show for the last couple months. So they know when every single thing is going to happen. So I'll try to connect with one of those guys and be like, hey, is there any pyro? Are there, is there any confetti? Are there any lasers? Like, what's going on with the show? I try to get a run of show from them because that is a huge advantage for me. If I know, oh, for yeah, sure. at the end of song two, they're going to shoot confetti. I'm like, yeah. oh, okay. Well, I want to be a little further back in the crowd so I can capture this right. confetti experience. So uh, that's one of my, my main things is I'll talk to them. And then outside of that, just seeing things, I guess. I, I try to capture what I'm seeing if I was there as a fan. Like, what's going to get me excited? Like, what? how am I seeing this artist? How does the artist want to be seen? So I try to capture images like that. Some of them may be lucky. I don't know. That's weird to say because I know what I'm doing. So it's not really like I'm just like, oh, no, maybe I'll get a good one, you know? Um, yeah. But I just try to work through my paces, you know? I want to get up close shots of the artist. I want to try to capture some of their emotion when they're singing, you mm-hmm. know, if they're a vocalist. I don't want them just standing there. I want them like, ah, you know, like I want you to be able to see them doing their art. If they're playing guitar, you know, you, I want to get shots of their hands on the guitar, you know, the drummers, I want to get photos of them drumming where it doesn't look like they're still, but you could see they're like moving at a fast pace, keeping the music going. Right. So I kind of like to capture the, the liveliness of what's happening and everything's different, you know, from country music to electronic music. It's all just like, Whoa, this is all so different. Like, but at the end of the day, it's just finding moments being a lot of it's just being in the right place at the right time, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and just knowing like your angles, like, you know, you have little tricks up your sleeve that we like to use and, and just, it's just like everything. It kind of, over time, you kind of develop a knack for it. You've seen these performers and different performances before, so you kind of understand what's happening. What's the, been the most memorable concert or experience that you've ever shot? Man, that's a great question. Because I feel like so many of them are memorable. I mean, EDC Las Vegas... Uh, in 2015, that was my first like major music festival, like holy cow thing. So I think that was like my most memorable. Like it was so much work, it was so hard. You know, I worked alongside great people that I'm still friends with a lot of them today, actually. And we're all still shooting music. It's kind of cool to be like in the industry with a lot of these people still. Mm-hmm. Um, also shooting, you know, le- like. Uh, legendary artists like just this past year i shot um elton john okay which that was pretty incredible like Mm. i didn't know i'd get the opportunity to to do that you know 
um, a few years back, I shot Paul McCartney, Sir Paul McCartney, oh. my apologies, <laughs> um, which was phenomenal. You know, that was a really cool experience. I mean, these are, these are iconic music legends. Yeah. Garth Brooks was another one. Mm. And, you know, that was a sold out record setting right. show at Petco Park. I think it was 53,000 people. Mm -hmm. How much interaction do you get with the artists? Um, it, it, it very much depends on the artist. Like, um, uh, I, I didn't see Paul McCartney. I didn't see Paul McCartney at all. Yeah. You know, they have their own team, things like that. Uh, Elton John, same thing, you know, yeah. for the most part, I don't really meet the artists. I was fortunate enough. I got to meet, uh, Garth Brooks. Okay. That was really cool just because yeah. I was having to take some photos of him and the CEO of the Padres. They did some interactions. So I was just there like photographing them, like. Mm -hmm. shaking hands he had given him a surfboard because it was a record setting concert so i got to be in the same area as that so i got to meet him and shake his hand mm. so that was really cool so it's like i could have zero interaction or i could have uh, a, a slight interaction with them but most of the time i'm just working taking photos i don't really get to meet the artist for sure unfortunately. Mm -hmm. but um those are probably my most memorable mm -hmm my memorable shows because yeah. they're just iconic you know red hot chili peppers that was a that oh. was another iconic band i mean i grew up listening to yeah. the red hot chili peppers you know like are you kidding yeah. me like yeah what Did, the hell didn't you shoot morgan wallen this year too i, I just shot, shot morgan wallen like a few days ago that was on oh, the wow. 30th where was that show uh the morgan oh no morgan wallen was earlier in the year yeah, yeah you're absolutely right that mm -hmm. was at petco park and that was in July or something, yeah. I think. You, yeah. Yeah. That was a great show. I got to meet him, too. Oh, cool. Because I was taking some photos in, like, the green room. And then, you know, he came in, and I was just like, oh, hey, how you doing? You know, I wasn't like, what's right. up, Morgan? We're best friends. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, it's just like, he's saying hi to, like, 500 people. Sure. So. Yeah. But um, it was it was really cool. And his show was phenomenal, you yeah. know? Like, that was another show where there was a lot happening. So I had to talk to, like, the pyro crew the show manager, like I, to see what was going on yeah. because there was confetti, pyrotechnics, yep. lasers, I remember. Yeah. boom, boom. Did you go I to did, the show? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. You know, it was, it was a hell of a show. Yeah. There was a lot going on at that show. I think I shot two nights of that show yeah. too. That's so right. That was intense. Uh, the, the show I shot more recently that I was getting was Zach Bryan. Uh -huh. He was just here. He had a sold out concert. It was a few nights Go ago. Park. It was on the 30th of December. Yeah. yeah. It was like a week ago. And that was like, 43,000 people. Oh, wow. It was crazy. <laughs> F full fireworks yeah. going on. It was it was a phenomenal show, yeah. you know. He, and I remember I shot some photos of him like a year ago, mm -hmm. and he was at Gallagher Square in Petco Park, and it wasn't even sold out. Wow. There was maybe 7,000 people there. So in a year, he had grown his popularity and fan base to sell out the, the inside of the stadium. When mm -hmm. Just the year before, he was just at the outside part of it and couldn't couldn't sell it out. Yeah, just that was a crazy progression to see an artist do. Oh yeah, see it, and I can imagine from your perspective being in that position of of photographing an event and then seeing that artist blow up over the next few years yeah. and then maybe continuing to work with them in the future. Uh, I mean, what inspiration that might give you? Huh? Yeah, absolutely. It's just like don't stop. Yeah, don't stop doing whatever you're doing. You know, I, I, I couldn't say that more, especially with like the country music guys. Like, I mean, I'm sure he's, he was big all over the country, but like in San Diego to see him go from a small venue and then a year later, maybe two years later, sell out the stadium. Right. That's like, holy cow, dude. What? Incredible. In a two year span. That's just like, yo, he just got to work and he just kept on working for sure. Cause he was obviously popular, but he really just leveraged himself and catapulted into a whole new. Yeah genre and, and superstardom at that point so and i mean you know that is highly inspirational and motivational to see you know that happen and the same is with like you know i shoot a lot of these electronic music events like the raves like the cross fest and you see these artists that are you know the the ones that play during the daytime the openers and then you know a few years down the road they're the headlining artist you're like oh i wait i remember when you were just like the opener artist and maybe there'd be a handful of people here to see you but now you're like selling out the whole damn thing right it's just it's phenomenal yeah to see and it just gives you that like tenacity to continue working and, and you know just keep at it yeah whatever it is you do just keep at it you know it's, it's so key and, and sort of related to that point what would you say has been your biggest challenge in this journey uh, more on the entrepreneurial side 
It could be a general or specific answer. Um, you know, I would say the challenge is knowing your worth, setting your rates, setting your price, setting your value right. for what you offer and what you give to clients. Because, you know, it, it's also tricky because not every client is a big budget client. Yeah. So it's like, are you just in it for the money? Or do you are you passionate about you what you do is your for work, you know? Because I have some clients that they don't have the same budget as other clients. And that's just life. You know, of course I want every one of my clients to be the biggest budgeted client that's out there and just have the deep pockets and I could just be like, let's go all out for this project and let's like, you know, but I also have to be realistic, you know. I you know. So I, I think that's probably one of the trickier things is figuring out like, well, how much do I charge? You know, and then is that fair for me to charge that much? Mm. You know, because I'm not only spending my time to get to the location, I have to shoot and then I have to edit. Like yep. we talked about going through the thousands sure. of photos, like the process right. of that, yep. mm -hmm. you know, we didn't really touch on that, but that's a, that's a process in its own. But for me, I'll kind of jump to that okay. process real quick. Um, when I'm shooting an event or photographing an event, I'm kind of making a mental log of like the moments I'm remembering, like as I'm shooting it, I'm like, Oh, that's the shot I want. Like mm. I, that's the one I got, you know, cause I'll take a series, but I know within that series, there's going to be the one I needed. Yeah. So a lot of it, a lot of it is that like mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's knowing I captured the moment and at a specific time so I can go back and, and then correlate that into my final album because my album has to consist of like, you know, the hero shots, obviously, like the, oh shit, you yeah. know. But then I also need like some cool, just crowd shots or just some good layout shots. Just you know, a shot of like the merchandise. I have to get a shot of that, you know. So it, it's just it's just remembering. It's a little bit of remembering and knowing that I got it because I like to work, you know, like I'm with a, like a mental checklist when I'm shooting a show or an event for that matter. It's like okay, I got to get a which might be like setup and layout and security and decoration or, you know, whatever that may be. And then I got to get like the flow of the event. So if I'm attending this event, like how is it for me to come in the entryway? What am I going to see first? You know? So it's like, I got to kind of capture those moments. And then it's like, all right, I need some hero shots now. So I kind of work through like a mental checklist mm. of like what needs to be done and, and what the client is looking for. Cause some of my clients, they just like, they're like, go shoot. <laughs> like we right. know you know what you're doing just go shoot and i'll be like well if there's anything specific please tell me because yeah. you know just i might miss something yeah. you know so i always ask you know anything specific please just remind me or shoot me a text or or they make shot lists for me which are great like they just they, then i have a list of stuff i know i have to get and then i can also get things i see outside of that which is great you know mm -hmm. so i have direction and artistic freedom at the same time and then, then it comes down to, you know, calling the images. So, I, you know, I might shoot a, you know, like I think Zach Bryant, you know, that concert, I'm trying to think, but I think I probably shot like 1700 photos. But a lot of that is you got to understand, I'm also trying to capture the perfect timing of like pyrotechnic hits. Yeah, for sure. So I'm on the roof of the Omni across the way, looking into San Diego, mm -hmm. the Petco Park Stadium. And I'm having to like listen to the music and wait for when like, all of the lights are going off at the exact same time to capture that mm. aha moment. Right. So I, you know, I might take 30 photos trying to capture that one photo. So saying I'm taking 1700 photos doesn't mean there's 1700 photos that are all top tier, you uh -huh. know, out of that 1700, you know, I'll, I'll whittle it down to like another, you know, 40%. Boom. Then I have to whittle that down to like another 40%. So, you know, I'm ending up with like a, you know, maybe a 10% keep out of all of those images, just because mm. in trying to capture the perfect image, I'm going to get some duds along the way. Right. Because, you know, if I want to capture them on stage, you know, yelling in the mic with the light shooting behind them just perfectly, like, you're not going to time that perfectly every time. So I have to, well, first of all, see that image happen and know that I can capture it. And then I have to get into position and, and, and like burst fire mm. to capture that exact moment the way I'm seeing it in my mind so then I can share that photo with the client. That's fascinating. Yeah, that's kind of the process of it, I guess, is I'll see things and then I got to get into position to capture them the way mm -hmm. I'm seeing them, you know, to capture that moment. Yeah. Well, so interesting to hear your philosophy on how you shoot your photography, the whole process around that and how you grew the business and your brand. 
Uh, I do just want to ask some more general business questions Please. just from what you've learned. And uh, one of them is a fun one I ask every person on the podcast, but it's if you had an answer to the question of what's an entrepreneurial life hack that goes against the mainstream belief, something unique to your journey that you could share, what would that be? Oh, man. I mean, I, I feel like everyone says, says this, but just stick with it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's going to be uneasy. It's going to be it's going to be rough. It's going to be hard. You're going to be broke. You're going to be like, what am I doing? Like, why am I even doing this? But if you know this is what you want to do and there is a market for it. I mean, obviously, if you're, you know, I mean, I, 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 that's wrong because I would say if you're going to sell rocks, that's not a thing. But there was a guy that sold pet rocks <laughs> and he made money doing that. So, like, anything is possible. It's just it's just stomaching it. That's what I would say, because we're so conditioned this day and age to just get a job work nine to five you know abc one two three like just do that you'll be like take the safe route you know and entrepreneurial stuff isn't safe quote unquote right. you know because you don't know where your next check's coming from you don't know if next month you're going to make four thousand maybe you'll make eight thousand you might even make twelve thousand dollars next month mm -hmm. or you'll make twelve hundred yeah. too so there's this huge varying scale of like, how much money am I going to make? And that's where it's also, you can't just be hyper-focused on how much money you're making. Mm -hmm. You have to, you have to feel good about what you're doing mm. and know that there will be an outcome. So my advice would be just stomach it. Just, it's going to suck. You might not like it. You might hate it, but if you really care about it, you'll continue to do it and it'll pay off. Man, Eric, such a good answer. I love that. Thank you. I yeah. appreciate that. I hope that's helpful to somebody. It, oh, man, it's helpful to me. Cool. Yeah. Amazing. What is your next big goal in your journey? I've been thinking about this a lot lately. And um, I feel like I'm at a great place right now in my career. I think my next goal is to just kind of work with some more um, reputable clients just not that the clients I work with now aren't reputable. I just want to have more of the client base. You know, I love working with, you know, like Hyatt is one Petco park. I love working. I love working in these high pressure situations, kind of, because there's a lot riding on it. You know, I, I can't drop the ball because if I do, it's on me, mm -hmm. you know, but that kind of pressure, um, I strive in those type of environments work wise. So I, I, I think my goal is to, you know, reach out to more of these companies I want to work with, with a purpose though, not just to work with them, you know? So I, I think I'm going to be making a list here in the next couple of weeks of like companies I want to work with or, or things I want to do as a photographer, you know, even things as simple as, you know, I was talking with a friend of mine who owns some Airbnbs and there's like a lot of work opportunity as a photographer within Airbnb. And I'm not talking about shooting the insides of Airbnbs, but just other things to bring the environment of where the Airbnb is into the home through imagery. Very so cool. finding clients like that, where I could potentially be traveling around the world mm -hmm. using my skill set and also getting a, a, a wide variety of client base, you know, on a, on a personal level clients, you know, that are mm -hmm. reputable as, as just an industry where they're doing real estate. Cause that's a great thing, you yeah. know? Um, but I want to shoot more concerts, mm -hmm. which is, is kind of already happening with, right. with Petco Park this year. And I'm so thankful to be part of that team and just have that opportunity to yeah. be there and, and let my skills kind of shine in that arena, so to speak. Uh -huh. um, just overall more growth with what you've been doing. Just more growth with what more I'm expansion. doing. Yeah, just more expansion. You know, mm -hmm. I'm ready to do more. I, mean, I work a lot now as it is, but I, there's always room for some more work. You sure. know, I'm just looking to do more. A little more traveling mm -hmm. with work too. So just... I don't know. I'm just putting it out. I'm just put. I'm putting it out I'll there, like it. you know. But I'll, I'll do outreach. That's where I kind of do. You know, I'll focus in, and I'll yep. you know, I'll do some self meditation, and, mm -hmm. and just sit down and get get kind of in my zone and figure out what I want to do, and then I'll just I'll try to put it out there. I'll ask people, hey, do you know anybody that's involved in this? And then, you know, always ask your friends if they know somebody. Yeah, that is the best way to get places. Is right, just asking for some help. Mm -hmm. Another entrepreneurial tip, ask for help. Yes, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool, man. Well, I love it. Is there anyone you have in mind of, uh, in your network that I should have on the show? Oh, man, there's a couple people. I will list them. Please. Um, 
you know, I think my friend Jess Gallo would be an amazing entrepreneur. She's a, a female photographer and she's doing a lot of wild expansion stuff. She works with some amazing brands. Cool. Um, another guy would be my friend Elliot, who's a he's a professional skateboarder, megavert, really cool, talented guy. And then I would also recommend my friend Aaron Delavadova, who's a phenomenal tattoo artist. Mm. And he also has a podcast called Chats and Tats. Oh, cool. So oh. You kind of got that in common. Oh, wow. And, um, I think I've heard of that. Yeah, I'd be happy to reach out to all three of them, too, and, and connect you with all, all three of them and connect you with them because um, there's some interesting folks that I love to work with that I know and that uh, I think could add value to what you're doing. Well, thank you, Eric. Yeah, I'll, let, yeah, I'll follow up with you on getting in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Nice, man. Well, amazing journey. I, I, I love asking about it, learning about it, hearing about it. And you've obviously built a great online presence. You have such a great portfolio on your website and then your Instagram. You've grown that to about 125,000 followers with, yeah. your, with your photography on there. Uh, why don't you share your how people can find you online and see your work? Yeah, absolutely. Just uh, at Eric underscore sire s-c-i-r-e is my instagram um my website is eric i think I, I don't even think i used i just use instagram and my sure and website. and my website for the most part a little bit of facebook but mm -hmm. that's the, just eric sire is the best way to get in touch with me and um yeah i'm ready to work you know whatever it. it is if you have questions you want to reach out to me you have questions about anything photography wise business wise working in photography reach out. I'm, I'm happy to speak with anybody about it. Yeah. You know, the only way we get better is by learning. So hundred percent. Yeah. Well guys, check out Eric's stuff. It's really incredible. You, you see it on the wall up here. If you're watching on YouTube and man, I, it, it, it's, it's just awesome work that, that he's put together. So Eric, thank you for being on the show thank and sharing you, Chris, your story thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. Bye everybody. Bye. Thanks for joining me for this episode of the Nickels and Dimes show. Please hit the subscribe button on YouTube and follow my Instagram page at Nickels and Dimes. The podcast Instagram page is at Nickels and Dimes show. And please like any of the videos you come across on either platform and leave a comment, leave feedback. It helps me to improve and innovate and to continue to scale and bring more interesting guests to the Nickels and Dimes show. Thank you all for the support and we'll see you next time.